It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 201, King Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and the Battle of Carchemish. After the death of King Josiah, everything goes bad for Israel as a nation. Josiah is brought back to Jerusalem. He's dead, and everyone mourns for him greatly. The king, the last great king, he did so much right, but he failed in his final moment. He took off his spiritual armor and went into battle and died of his wounds. The moment he died, Israel was doomed, mainly because his descendants were not up for the job. He brought about great change, but like Hezekiah, it seemed to go with him. Saying the leaders after him are poor is being kind, but at the same time, they weren't the worst, but they were just poor when good and exceptional was required. They weren't faithful to God and they were disobedient, but they were still nothing like Manasseh or Ammon. In fact, it's the sins of these two leaders and the innocent blood they shed and all their wickedness which is catching up with Judah. It's up to Josiah's son to steer the sinking ship as his father's killed. And when the true godly king makes a grievous error by going into battle, this is Josiah, he opened a door to the devil to steal, kill, and destroy. And the king dies first, removing the godly covering of the kingdom, opening huge doors for the entirety of dark forces to come and deal a decisive blow to the entirety of Judah. And what happens next is calamity after calamity, as Judah is sandwiched between two warring powers, Egypt and Babylon. After Josiah is killed, Jehoahaz, one of the younger sons of Josiah, is declared king. He rules only three months, but this was enough time for Josephus to declare this about him. He was an impious man, impure in his course of life. That's pretty bad if three months in, he's already got that kind of a reputation. Well, Pharaoh Necho calls for him to visit him at his Syrian base. As Jehoahaz arrives, he keeps him permanently. With him must have been another brother, Eliakim. I imagine this is how it went down. It's, I don't know for sure, but this, this is how I picture it going down. It's all a power play by Necho. Necho tells Eliakim, he will be his king in Jerusalem. I will take your brother hostage, and if you fail to pay me tribute money, I will kill him. And that's probably, I'm guessing, how it went down. Necho holds Judah hostage through the capture of its king, and a hefty war tribute is expected from it. Necho's army was mostly mercenaries, even some from Greece. Judah's tribute helped keep Necho's army in the field controlling Syria. Necho renames Eliakim Jehoiakim. And we now have a subservient Judah to Egypt. It's king, a puppet ruler of Egypt. And at the moment, Necho is thinking he's one of the greatest pharaohs of all time. But like the time of Josiah, he's only filling a vacuum. Ruling by exercising of threats and worldly power, Necho rules over Judah and uh, the area above it. You could even call it, uh, you know, modern Syria. We could just even call it the old Aram. Eliakim, now Jehoiakim, is forced to take from the people to pay Pharaoh his taxes or his tribute. See, it's one disaster after another. In Judah at the moment, all of it started with the death of the godly King Josiah. And what's the lesson here again? Never go into battle without your armor on, or you can leave the next generation defenseless, struggling with anarchy and an enemy charging in like a flood. So what happened to Jehoahaz? Well, He's taken to Egypt, and we never hear from him again. The Bible says he actually dies there. What a horrible account for a king of Israel. His brother, Jehoiakim, will go on to rule for 11 years. His first four years are just as nasty as his brothers. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of detail, um, except when you look at it through the lenses of Jeremiah. Josephus says the following about Jehoiakim. He was of a wicked disposition and ready to do mischief. 
nor was he either religious towards God or good nature towards men. And Jewish history has a horrible account of this king, but the Bible speaks also of the innocent blood that he sheds. So this is, guy is a bit of a mix of nasty and weird. He's not bloodthirsty per se, but he's capable of murder and wickedness, and he's not a good king. He's not faithful to God, but he's still no Manasseh. But there is definitely a culture shift and Judah, and I keep saying interchanging Judah and Israel here because it, Judah had taken over old Israel, but now it's just Judah. There's a culture shift here. And amazing how that cycle of sin works. Josiah is zealous for God, and he brings in revival. And the sons of him that rule are wicked, selfish bunch. Their administration only encouraging their wicked behaviors. And, and what you've got here is you've got a new king in charge. He gets to a point the new Levites, who serve God the way he serves God. And he gets to encourage the prophets who speak what he believes, and he didn't believe in God. So he has the structure of his father, but he pollutes the system to serve um, his gods. Now, the first four years of Jehoiakim's rule has a lot going on. We see the rise of the prophet Jeremiah to confront the evils of the world and also to confront these wicked kings. So now we've got the source of the book of Jeremiah to tie into Chronicles and 2 Kings. But one of the problems is trying to tie the prophecies of Jeremiah um, into this timeline because it's not written in chronological order. But regardless, we've got a lot of prophecies um, and we start now to weave into our storyline the prophet Jeremiah, into our midst. It's like the rise of Jehoiakim to the throne, and his wickedness was the indicator for Jeremiah to step up and to begin his ministry. Now, there's a preface to this story. There was a prophet who arose to confront Jehoiakim sometime before Jeremiah rose on the scene. His name was Uriah, and he prophesied Judah's destruction. And when the king heard his words, he was determined to put him to death. Uriah, learning of this, fled to, in fear to Egypt out of safety. But this is what happens. Jeremiah 26, 22. King Jehoiakim, however, sent El-Nathan, son of Akbor, to Egypt, along with some other men. They brought Uriah out of Egypt and took him to King Jehoiakim, who had him struck down with a sword and his body thrown in the burial place of the common people. Okay, so this Jehoiakim is a nasty king. And this is the preface for God calling Jeremiah out of the quiet wilderness into public view. Jeremiah 26. Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people, the towns of Judah, who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent and not inflict on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law, which I have set before you, if do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I am sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and this house a curse among all the nations of the earth. The priests, the prophets, and all the people heard Jeremiah speak these words in the house of the Lord. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, the priests, the prophets, and all the people seized him and said, You must die. Why do you prophesy in the Lord's name that this house will be like Shiloh, and this city will be desolate and deserted? And all the people crowded around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. So as Jeremiah prophesies, it is the people priests and prophets that are going to demand his death, specifically the priest and the prophets. Now, these are corrupted priests and prophets. These are the ones appointed by Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim's only got this reign of like four years um, between uh, in this episode we're covering here. So he quickly almost dismantles his father's legacy um, by reappointing and, and probably removing Levites that were faithful to God and putting other ones in place, 
um, putting false prophets, rising them to kind of high counselor type status. Um, the, it's changing and in, in quickly into a wicked place, Judah. And it's these false priests and prophets that are going to demand the death of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 26.10 And when the officials of Judah heard about these things, they went out from the royal palace to the house of the Lord and took their places at the entrance in the new gate of the Lord's house. Then the priest and the prophet said to the officials and all the people, This man should be sentenced to death because he has prophesied against this city. You have heard it with your own ears. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. And as for me, I am in your hands. Do for me whatever you think it is right and good. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city and on those who live in it. For in truth, the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. So the officials show up to hear what the people, priests, and prophets are saying. And it appears these officials are now being turned by the priest and the prophets in this raging crowd to agree that he should be put to death. Jeremiah 26, 16. Then the officials and all the people said to the priest and the prophets, this man should be sentenced to death. So the people, the false prophets, the false priest, now the officials want to put Jeremiah to death, just like Uriah was killed before. But it's the elders that step forth and help to save him. And these are the elders, these are the older generation that maybe grew up with Josiah or knew of his ways. And they're not easily persuaded to go back um, and not worship God. Jeremiah 26, 17. Some of the elders of the land stepped forward and said to the entire assembly of the people, Micah of Moreshath prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, he told all the people of Judah, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, or anyone else in Judah, put him to death? Did not Hezekiah fear the Lord and seek his favor? Did not the Lord relent so that he did not bring disaster he pronounced against them? We are about to bring a terrible disaster on ourselves. So it's the elders who prevailed and quoted how Hezekiah saved the day through his faithfulness to God and repentance. Jeremiah was released, and it even suggests, too, that another elder kind of grabbed him and hid him away. He was not put to death, potentially because Jehoiakim realized there was some negative response he would have received, um, just like when he killed Uriah. Further, other members of Jehoiakim's court vouched for his safety. It's the ascent of Jehoiakim to the throne, which coincides with the start of these prophecies by Jeremiah. Most of the prophecies concern the end of Judah. Geopolitically, things are changing really quick. During the four-year period, following the previous episode and the death of Josiah, a lot has happened. The Medes are happy consolidating their power in the east. The Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar are doing the same in Babylon, and their lands include the previous area of Assyria, all the way to the borders of the old Aram territory, uh, where Necho has set up base camps, expanding his empire. Nabopolassar seems to want to stop making war for his final years, and he's aging. He's handing over more and more power to his son Nebuchadnezzar, and the two are conducting massive building projects in Babylon, from the Hanging Gardens of Babylon from the seven wonders of the world as proclaimed by Herodotus to the remodels of the original Tower of Babel. All of their resources are, are being funneled into Babylon. And let's remember, this is where the world's central gold reserves just landed after Nineveh was sacked. The commercial center of the world is now Babylon. After a few years, Nabopolassar falls ill, and we will see he goes on less military campaigns and he allows his son to conduct them. The tensions between Egypt and Babylon are going to grow until we reach a conflict stage. And no longer will just generals with small divisions be in contact with Egypt. 
but entire armies will be fielded to destroy the Egyptians and push them out of Syria. While Nebuchadnezzar seemed to not want war with Egypt, his son does, and he pursues conflict. By the end of the fourth year, since the death of Josiah, Nebuchadnezzar was determined to destroy the Egyptians in Syria. He marches the entirety of the Babylonian army to Syria. Necho is caught off guard, and his forces are surprise attacked by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. The Babylonians are veteran killers at this stage over decades of warfare. The Egyptians have relatively no battlefield experience in comparison. The experience gap is enough to spell disaster for Necho. He has no technological advantage. Um, he may have actually had more soldiers than the Babylonian armies, but there was a surprise attack by Nebuchadnezzar. In addition to that, the just experience gap was too much. And there is some debate whether Carchemish, which is where this battle occurred, if there was actually some Assyrian soldiers still fighting. No matter, the Assyrians as a race that dominated the world are no more. You can visit their ruins and find the prophet Jonah's final resting place in about six different disputed locations. But as for the terrors that dominated the world of the Assyrians, they're no more. The Babylonian chronicles, now housed in the British Museum, claim that Nebuchadnezzar crossed the river to go against the Egyptian army which lay in Carchemish. The armies fought with each other, and the Egyptian army withdrew before him. He accomplished their defeat and beat them to non-existence. As for the rest of the Egyptian army, which had escaped from the defeat so quickly that no weapon had reached them, the Babylonians overtook and defeated them in the district of Hamath, so that not a single man escaped to his own country. Nebuchadnezzar would sweep into Judah, the coastal plain, and invade Egypt itself. Nothing except his pride would stop Nebuchadnezzar from taking over the region. As Nebuchadnezzar marched into Judah, it was his prize. The gates of Jerusalem were flung open to him. Jehoiakim was now a subject king to the king of Babylon, and with it we enter the exile period of biblical history, which I am labeling the age of prophets and empires. Let's conclude this episode with something that shows how terrible yet how promising the future is. Who knew one of the most powerful men, most influential men who ever walks the earth was actually dwelling in Jerusalem at this time? A strong, handsome, lean, intelligent young man. He's probably 12 or younger. And we conclude this episode setting the stage for the future to come and revealing how advisors, wise men, and prophets were getting relocated to Babylon from across the world, and we start to tell our story from two locations, Babylon and Jerusalem, for a season. A prophet of prophets, a modern-day Joseph, was walking in their midst, and they didn't even know it. Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were choos chosen were from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Josephus adds additional detail to the scene. But now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took some of the most noble of the Jews that were children, and the kinsmen of Zedekiah their king, such as were remarkable for the beauty of their bodies and the comeliness of their countenances, and delivered them into the hands of the tutors and to the improvement to be made upon them. He also made some of them to be eunuchs, which course he took also with those of other nations whom he had taken in the flower of their age, and afforded them their diet from his own table and had them instructed in the institutions of their country, taught the learning of the Chaldeans, 
and they had exercised themselves sufficiently in that wisdom which he had ordered them that they should apply themselves to. Now among these were four from the family of Zedekiah, a most excellent dispositions, one of whom was called Daniel, another Ananias, another Mishael, and the fourth Azarias. These the king had in esteem, and it continued to love, because of the very excellent temper they were of, and because of their application to learning, and their possession that they had of wisdom. So here's a programming note. We're taking a week off for some travel, so we won't have an episode next week. Uh, but when we return, we hope to have a five-year anniversary podcast special. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. Feel free to visit the website, messagetokings.com. Share the Facebook page, or if you want to chat, email us at messagetokings at gmail.com.